live tonight on uh, Monday. What is this? The I don't know the date. The fifth, fourteenth, fourteenth. Okay, the fourteenth of uh, July. And uh, Jimmy will be joining me here in a in a moment. He's uh, getting all the computer stuff and the camera uh, going, and we'll have a discussion here. Uh, again, let me just remind those of you who are watching and those of you who will watch, since this is already being recorded and will be there. Uh, the first, well, it wouldn't be the first. Let me just give the dates. The 8th, 9th, and 10th of August. The 8th, 9th, and the 10th of August will be um, a conference, a regional conference in uh, Tazewell, Virginia there with uh, Pastor Peggy Carr and uh, so that's the dates for this uh, upcoming conference again August the 8th, 9th and 10th Friday, Saturday and Sunday so if you're interested in going there uh, there's there's <clears throat> hotels around that area um, and uh, I think it's uh, Pounding Mill or something like that Virginia or, uh, in that area so um, if if you're interested in going we will have some uh, information up there uh, in the next couple of days on the website in our uh, fellowship information tab and then there's a, a deal for conferences upcoming conferences or conferences so you just go there and and uh, you can you can see the the dates and the time and even <clears throat> the places that you can stay but again hotels around that area they also have some rooms at the tabernacle um, there where we have the meetings so uh, if you can contact sister Carr, uh, there may be some rooms available there that uh, you can get first come first serve i would guess unless they've already been taken and uh, so that's that's uh, that. And then let me just uh, repeat from yesterday. We're going to start, or we have started a new class. Daniel Brown has started the new class, and uh, it's on Sundays at four o'clock, and it'll be a weekly class. So every week at four o'clock on Sunday, uh, of course, four o'clock p.m. on Sunday there will be a uh, class that will be live uh, a class that's there is called all things in christ and daniel brown will be teaching that class every week so i would uh, encourage you to to uh, go to the website or go to Ustream. it's going to be in the same uh, place as our uh, wednesday night classes it'll be under bible classes um, uh, what is it? Yeah, School of Christ, but it just says uh, Bible classes or something on the home page. Uh, so you you know when you go to our home page, it's all listed there. You have Sunday, Monday, and then the Bible classes. So just click watch us live during the Bible class uh, on Sunday at four o'clock, and Daniel will be teaching that class. So I think that's it for the announcements. Um, I want to. I want to start, and we. I, I don't really know what we're going to get into tonight, but I do want to start by reading something from Brother Sparks that I read recently, and uh, even put part of it in a post. Uh, on Facebook that I put up and uh, just want to read the whole thing because to me it just it's a beautiful it's a beautiful declaration of something that's uh, been on my heart for a long time <clears throat> but recently has been on my heart even even more and uh, it's from an article I think just an article called entering into God's rest and I may not be able to get through this first sentence, but I love this part. Adam's, this is the first, Brother Sparks, first verse, or first sentence. Adam's first day on this earth 
was a Sabbath day. God created man on the sixth day, and the first complete day that man had was the Sabbath. The Sabbath day becomes the first day for man. I just thought that was, I just, man, I thought that was tremendous. It starts there. Yeah, well, um, he, create, he creates the soul of man on the sixth day yeah. where there is no rest. Right. Until he enters the rest of God. Yeah, and it's in a. There's the rest of the soul. And, and when God's rest is, is found, man's rest is entered into. Exactly. And th- that's just. I love that. I've actually been looking at Hebrews. <laughs> yeah, I, I've got it. Hebrews 4. I've got it right here. That's what I'm looking at. Good, I'm glad. That's what we're looking at there. The scene is, is basic. It's, it's this. You know, even like how it says in Hebrews, uh, less thinking you've come short of that rest. Seeming to have come short. And yeah. the thing is, is that the, at the moment of new birth, when we enter into rest, yeah. That's when rest begins. Yeah. Before then, it's all man. It's like the sixth day. It's all man. It's all works. It's all activities. It's all laborious. You know, there's no rest for the soul. But the moment the soul is born again, you've entered into that rest. Yeah. The rest is there. And it's like he creates the soul, and then you have this beautiful declaration of God that says, and God beheld everything that he had made, and it was very good, and he found rest, and he rested from his labors. You know, it's like God was fully satisfied in it, and his rest was found on the seventh day. Okay, he came to his rest, and again, he brings man immediately. Man immediately, basically awakes in God's rest. And I see the verse, you know, created in Christ Jesus. It's like brought immediately into a perfect rest, uh, a Sabbath day, that eternal day. And it's so important for us to understand that's where we begin. That's where we start. Because so many don't understand that as the basis of their pursuit of God. If that's not the basis out from which any pursuing of God takes place, then that pursuing of God is going to be like a roller coaster ride. What, what it ends up being is, is you're trying to get there. Yeah, yeah. Or you're trying to get to that relationship. Yeah. Or you're trying to get to. And it's, it's already there. And found. I don't want to say found in Christ, but found in the person of Christ. Let me read the rest of this and then we'll go from there. Because I had uh, Hebrews 4 in my mind to, to talk about too. And Uh, some other stuff so great Um, so the Sabbath God's Sabbath becomes the first day for man carry over carried over to the New Testament where God finishes and perfects his new creation work in Jesus or in the Lord Jesus and enters into his rest it is God's Sabbath and there we begin that is our first day God's rest we begin in something that is already perfect. This is the ground of the everlasting covenant. To grasp the significance of that is to see what the eternal covenant is, to come right in on a perfect ground and start there. It is not how we regard ourselves or how we feel about ourselves or any other thing. It is God's place for us. The fact is, beloved, that in Jesus Christ, you and I will never be more perfect than we are now. Those perfections may be wrought into us progressively. But so far as the ground of our acceptance is concerned, we are accepted in the beloved one. And he wholly satisfies the Father. The Father has come to rest in him. The work is perfect. Our acceptance, and I'll go on, our acceptance and our pursuit and everything of our life in Christ is always on the ground of God's end being reached. 
is always on the ground of God's end already being reached. Till that is settled, we have no steadying when God begins to work in us. Do not forget that. If when God begins to deal with us in any way, discipline, chastening, training, forming, we begin at any moment to say, this is all because I'm so bad or I'm so wicked. The Lord's got to do something with me in order that I may be acceptable. We have given the sure ground away. We shall never be more acceptable, however much the Lord does in us. We have been accepted, not on the ground of what we are, however bad or good that may be, but on the ground of the Beloved, accepted in the Beloved One. We sing, and I wish we would lay it to heart more and more, that His perfections are the measure of our acceptance. I love that statement. His perfections are the measure of our acceptance. This is where we start. This is an emphasis of his. And this is an emphasis. I think this is what Paul means when he says, having begun in the spirit. Because he realizes the, just the comprehensive fullness that they had come to. Everything they had come to in Christ. Realizing that's where they started. And now because that had not been worked in their heart and they were not standing on that firm ground they could be deceived by Judaizers or they could be, you know, uh, their heart be deviated and diverted to some other object themselves uh, from such a, sure, some, such a sure reality. That is where we start. Blessed be the God. That is the ground of confidence. And when the Lord begins to take us in hand and we begin to feel what wretched creatures we are, that never implies for a single moment that we are not accepted. The eternal covenant means here in the first place that we are accepted on the ground of God's satisfaction in his son. If we were accepted on our own ground or basis where we stand in ourselves, there would be no eternal covenant, no ground of security at all. It would be a matter of how we might be today or tomorrow. But no, it is not a matter of how we are or shall be. The ground is settled in Christ. Now, God is only getting to work to make good in us, in comprehension, what is true in his Son. But that never changes the ground. Do not let us give our ground away. I think that's a great way to say it. I've been thinking about this on and off. Uh, and it's just, it's just been the whole either or. Yeah. Either or. The soul, before it's born again, has no life. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in God's in God's mind, no life is present. The moment, through God's mercy and grace, that a soul, by his miraculous miracle, comes to new birth, Christ appearing in that soul, then everything of Christ is present. Mm -hmm. That soul is now at rest because the rest of God, who is Christ, is present. Yeah. This, this, will, this will kind of this may blow you away. If I ever, or whoever, which for a believer, ever tries to get me to rest I will be in for one laborious, <laughs> fruitless effort of the flesh. Yeah. Christ is my rest. The rest is already present. That's why I like the way it, it reads, you know, in Hebrew, uh, seeming to have come short. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Well, if it's me 
I will always come short. Sure. You know, I always miss the moment. And that's the basis of the seeming. That's the basis of the assumption, looking at ourselves or the surroundings, or even in the basis of this, you were looking at the fact that there are still testimonial elements, types in the shadows and all that stuff. It's, it's always either or. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's either going to be me trying or it will be Christ be. being yeah. who he is yeah. the rest. It will be me trying to get God to accept me or me finding Christ as the acceptance that's already there. And you were saying that if man tries to bring me to a state where I can finally find rest or bring me to rest or however... He can't, first of all, that's an impossibility. And that's why it becomes such a laborious effort and, and work. Because this is even what some people have thought Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, is meaning here when he talks about labor to enter a rest. But that's not what he's talking about at all. Not even in the, the language is not what he's talking about. Uh, laboring. It's not about working. It's about giving diligence and uh, exerting toward the knowing. It's a rest that's already there. There remains a rest. There is a rest given, a rest provided. It's Christ. It remains there in him. It remains in him. It's like Peter that and we now, have. And, and, excuse me. Yeah. And I don't mean like it's found in him. No. I, I, this is because I've, I've, I've gone that route for a long time. Sure. And I get to know it. It's found in the person of Christ himself, him being that, him being that rest. Well, it's this. It caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Now he goes on. For you who are protected by the power of God, or kept is the better word, through faith unto a salvation that is ready to be revealed. It's kept, it's reserved in heaven or in Christ, ready to be revealed. It's all there. It's all there. Ready. It's, it's already there in, in its absolute fullness, ready to be revealed to those who will look for him, turn their heart. Or allow the Lord to turn their heart to see. I, I think what happens, and I mean, I, I just, you know, I guess I've, I've run the whole experience of it, and I'm pretty sure, it, you know, many others in the body of Christ have as well. I think what happens is that uh, somehow we we lose sight of Christ being the all and in all, mm -hmm. the all things testifying of Him, and. What we end up doing when, like even, even with this uh, passage in Hebrews, you know, less seemingly you, you may, uh, it may seem as you've come short of it. I, I think what happens is that what we end up doing is we basically, you know, like Abraham, we take an Ishmael, what we can do and say, Lord, let this one be before you. <laughs> you know, when we look at ourselves in the mirror, we, Lord, let this one be at rest. Lord, let this one be more loving. Lord, let this one have joy. Lord, let this one have peace. Lord, let the dot, 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 dot. And the whole time, I mean, that one, in the mind of God, had no life to begin with. The life that's now present is Isaac. Yeah. This one is the one whom God made the covenant with. This one has all the blessing of God. This one is at rest. This one, I mean, you can even think about this. This will blow a whole lot of people away. I don't think Isaac ever left the land. You know, it talks about, you know, uh, different ones. Even Abraham, he went to Egypt, he came back, da 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 da. Uh, Jacob, I don't know where he went, but then Jacob came back. Mm -hmm. Isaac didn't go anywhere. He didn't leave. He was always there. He was always there. He was always the one whom God had chosen. He was always God's fruit. Not man's fruit. God's fruit. You know? Man couldn't produce God's fruit. It was completely and is completely impossible because it's either man's fruit or it is God's fruit. Mm -hmm. 
If it's God, then you, I, man, had nothing to do with it. That's right. And yet he's right there, standing, accepted, because God accepted him, not based on works, not based on anything. There's, um, the whole situation, I think, comes down to this. You know, uh, and I, here lately, I've been referring to John the Baptist a whole lot, but I see just a whole lot with him right there. In John chapter 1, I mean, they're asking John, okay, who do you think you are? Who are you? Are you the Christ? Are you that prophet? Are you this? Or, you know, are you Elijah? And he's like, no, 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 no. I'm not the Christ. I'm not these guys. Well, give us a response so we can take to the ones who sent us, the Pharisees who sent them. And he basically says something like, you know, there's coming one after me. I'm not even worthy to lose the latchet of the sin. Here yeah. I am declaring the one to come, and yet I'm not even worthy of him. Then it goes down a little further with, with his speaking to these. He said, there stands one among you in your midst whom you know not. Yeah. whom you know not. And then he says, therefore am I come. He goes on, uh, I think a little further in that chapter one, that he may be made manifest mm -hmm. to Israel. That's it. He is there. The, everything that God has ever desired, the one who's there is present whom you know not, but that he may be made manifest to Israel. That's that's the whole that's the whole ball of wax, if you want to call it that. Uh, take the colloquialism out. That is what it is all about. Mm -hmm. That he may be made manifest to Israel, to that which is his. You know, the one he came to his own, not to the world, to that which is his. So you bring that into. Well, we would say that he may be manifest in us, revealed in us, appear in us. Yep. However, word, yeah. all these things, all these terms that only God can do. Yeah. And I, I only say that because manifest has been taken to mean yeah. external things. So, you, you know, it's, okay. it's, it's, just, it's just like this. You know, I don't, here, there's something here. That it may be made evident. No. Oh, look, it's always been there the whole time. Right. Here's my shiny pen. Right. Oh, you didn't know it, but it was here. Yeah. I knew it. I put it there. And it's. That's it. See, that. Made, made apparent. And that's the whole basis of Colossians 3. Seeing that you are risen with Christ, that sets the firm ground of union with Christ it sets everything in a in a in a state of perfection oh yeah and it says this then is the basis of your seeking since this is so seek what's above not to get there but in view of the fact that you are there you know and it then it goes on after saying this is the this is the ground that you're on let this be the ground of your seeking, the basis of your seeking. And then when he who is your life appears, made evident, then the glory that you have always been in with him will become made known unto you. What has always been will be made known in you. And then in that, he goes on, mortify therefore your members. See, because that's, the that's the result of having seen the one who is your life. Then you can reckon dead everything else. But to try to reckon dead everything else, having not yet seen, not only not seen him, but not even seen, known the ground of your seeking. I think mm -hmm. we're having some trouble here. But anyway, we'll... <laughs> but anyway... To me, it's so important that God always, Paul, there, and in every one of his letters, he sets first and foremost 
the sure and the certain ground that it's finished, it's a finished, perfect reality that we've come to. A finished and perfect uh, situation in which we find ourselves. And he always sets that as the basis of the thing. That in this time of fullness, in the dispensation of the fullness, God has summed up everything in his son. And then he says, therefore, I pray for you that the eyes of your understanding would be open and enlightened to this reality. See, he always begins by showing you the finished work at the very beginning. It's always that way. Because then, if not, if not, most people, because that has not taken place... And see, that only takes place when he appears in the seeing of Christ. That's why he must be revealed in you. Because if that doesn't happen, if the, if the end and the beginning is not revealed in your heart, and that's why it's so significant, I'm the end and the beginning, I'm the beginning and the end. Because in the seeing of him, you see, you see right up front everything that you're going to see. But what you're going to see is that reality just opened and unfolded in your heart. I mean, just the vistas of it opening. One of the, one of the things uh, that you just mentioned, and I'd like to clarify this, uh, because there may be some viewing, listening, watching, whatever, that may not uh, have, have the background on this, but the finished work is Christ himself. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's not what it's not necessarily what he does. No, it's who it's he is. Who he is. I like. I, I still go back to that one passage. I think it was in Luke. I'm not sure. And <laughs> that one uh, where you mentioned it, but um, where they come and you know tell Jesus, "Hey, you need to get out of here." Uh, I think it might have been Herod. He wants to kill you or something. He says, "Okay, you go tell that fox." Today and tomorrow, I do cures and cast out devils. The third day, I am perfected. Mm -hmm. The third day, I am the perfection. The third day, I am the consummation. And I love the way he stated that. He, he didn't say, I do. Yeah. I am. Sure. Huge difference on that. Huge difference. And that's, that's, the, whole, that's the whole thing, I, I think, even with... Um, with, with what I was just mentioning about John the Baptist, well, there stands one among you. Not there stands one among you that did or that, <coughs> or that does. Yep. There stands one among you who is. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus declared himself, I am, period. I am, dot, dot, dot. You can, you can, yeah. I am peace, I am love, I am the bread of life, I am the living waters. You can go on and on. I am. Not yeah. I do. Tell them that I am sent you. <laughs> Not I do sent you. No, I am. Yeah. The, uh, another thing that it just looks like that, and that's another thing with, uh, with Adam, I never noticed out of Adam, I never really paid attention to him. I never, I never brought there. It's so significant that he was brought into the Sabbath. Yeah. His first day was the Sabbath, yeah. in that sense. Yeah, everything was finished that's, before that's he came in. Jesus of Nazareth walked on the earth, and the way he told you know, to tell him to Herod, Herod, the first and the second day, he was on the earth. Not a fleshly body. The third day, he's perfected. When a, po when a person, when a soul is born again, they are not birthed of anything of that, of the first. Mm -hmm. They are not born of a Jesus of Nazareth. They are born of a risen Christ. The perfected the one. The resurrection, yeah. the perfection. New birth begins there. And that's Colossians 3 again. Risen with him because it is union with the one risen. Exactly. Is actually how it's, yes. how it's said there. It's one raised in union with one raised. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and that's, I mean, that's so important. Or we will live right here in the first verse of chapter 4 of Hebrews. 
seeming to come short. So we have to find whatever ways we are told or that we assume can alleviate that assumption of coming short or alleviate the coming short that we assume there is, you know. Uh, because every, to me, every religious pursuit, every pursuit that is not out of the seeing of the Lord comes from a sense of dissatisfaction. It comes from a heart that is not satisfied, that is not beholding a full, as John Kasser always says, that's not seeing the absolute that's there. So we live in a state, although God is fully satisfied, and not only that, the, here's the thing. God is not only satisfied up in heaven and you just, I mean, leaves us to, to make it however we can. Not only is he satisfied, that he by his grace has given us the one who is his satisfaction. And to me, that is the whole work of God in us. It is to open, unveil our hearts to his satisfaction, his view, his understanding. The one that he loves. The one who delights his heart fully. And to realize that that one is in me. And not only that, he has made unto me everything that he is unto the Father. And see, when my soul is beholding that one, that doesn't leave me believing, so I've got a license to do whatever I want. That, that, that's, that's not there. That's not even in the picture. That's not there. Because that one could soothe my heart to such a degree that all there is in my soul is a desire to know him greater, in a greater way. And so... Go ahead. The, the whole the whole thought thought I think you can see it once again. I thought about this while I was driving up here. There's a difference between me coming to the Lord and the Lord drawing me unto Christ. Yeah. There's a huge difference. There's a huge difference. See, because my coming unto the Lord does nothing. It's like the rich young ruler. I come, and then I go. I come, and then I go. Because that's me doing it. That's my effort. That is my ability. And yet when the Lord draws and brings unto the Son, it's, it's His doing. He hath done it. It's... it's it's no longer me, it's no longer I, but it's him. The one, I love what, what uh, the Apostle John basically said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. That which I thought was my life, in my own eyes, was seen to be not life at all. It's dead. Yeah. Him who is my life remains. With that thought, Let's get into this Hebrews four, because there's something there's something of that here. Let me let me just before we go there. Stop interrupting. Okay. No, just, <laughs> One last verse, and this this is actually the verse that I was looking for. Remember, um, actually no no, I was I was looking for this verse in my Spanish class yesterday. Oh, oh, okay. I took about a minute or two for people. <laughs> I was just searching. But it's the one that I was that, that I showed you mm -hmm. uh, yes showing you yesterday during during the service. Yeah. This is Jeremiah uh, chapter twenty three, verse twenty four. Right. This is the Lord speaking. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Mm. Saith the Lord, do not I fill heaven and earth. Yeah. Saith the Lord. Yeah, that's great. I remember when, when Daniel was really hammering on the tenses. There is no future tense in the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And that's how, I, that's how I kind of found all this strange stuff. And then it just hit me all again. Christ, who is the knowledge of God, fills the soul. It's either 
my knowledge or his knowledge. Yeah. If it's my knowledge, it is lacking, it will forever be lacking. If it is the knowledge of God, Christ himself fills. Yeah. Because he is there and he fills heaven yeah. and earth. And I just that's that's why that's why I just mentioned that it's it's an either or. Either or. And I don't fully understand it. I just know that I will never understand it. Because if I could understand it, it would be my understanding. Yeah. And it would not be the understanding of God, Christ. Do you see, even with sure. that, either or, sure. when it's God's understanding... Well, it is that, because that's how clean-cut the cross is, man. That's how clean-cut the whole thing is. There is no gray areas. It either is or it isn't. And if it is, and I perceive something that seems to contradict what is, that's not because what is is not. That's because my understanding of what is may not be correct no. or may not be there. Yeah. Or the understanding of what is correct may not be revealed in me. The fault does not lie with God. No, never. He's not to be blamed. It's my fault. Yeah. The fault is on me. And it's not so much my understanding isn't there. It's that... His understanding is not revealed in Correct. me. Yeah. My understanding will never be there. No, and that's and that's my, it. My Ishmael, my understanding, my wisdom, my, my righteousness, my everything, my Ishmael will never be Isaac. And that's like what you said. You know, it's it's it, what Isaiah six. You know, holy, 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 the whole earth is full of His glory, and. And that's what people don't understand because everything seems to contradict that. And not only you say in Hebrew, there's no future tense. In Christ, there's no future tense as well. You know, I am the same yesterday, today, forever. You know, there he is who he is. And he is that in us. Of his fullness we've received. There is nothing more of him to receive. There's nothing more of him to get, but there is an eternity of him to comprehend in his, in his appearing. That's where the need is. It's not to try to get anything that's contrary in natural, because that's, natural will always contradict the eternal reality. I will always contradict who he is. There is never a remedy to that. God did the only remedy to that, and that was the cross. The beauty of it is that I, through, the, through Christ, being baptized into him, have become dead to that. That is contrary to everything Christ is. And I am born of his life, of that incorruptible seed. And I love the way, because uh, speaking of things that seem contradictory, how, how John says it. And he that is born of that seed cannot sin. And you think... That is such. That, is, that can't be. But yeah, because he's looking at it from the proper perspective. He's seeing it from the perspective of the seed who dominates and dictates everything of our life. Not you. He's not looking at man and saying, man can't sin. No, he's saying the one who is born of the seed that is incorruptible cannot miss the mark. Because that seed cannot miss the mark. He cannot come short. And, and it's all about who he is in you. That's, that's the whole thing. It's about who he is in you. It's not about you. It's about who he is in you. And, and that's where we will get into this rest thing with that. But. I, uh, I, just, I just like incorruptible. Yeah. Beyond the touch of man. He, the, the, the father and the son relationship is a perfect relationship. I think with, with I guess I'll just say with me. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not going to say this is the norm for everyone. There is a continual drawing of the Spirit of the Lord 
the attention of my heart to place it upon Mark, Christ himself. Yeah. Because I'm prone to continually looking at Ishmael. Lord, fix this one. Lord, let this one stand before thy face. That's what, it, that's what he's saying. Yeah. Let this one stand before thee. Let this one stand before thy face. Yeah. Let this one be in thy presence. Before thy face is really where it comes out. Let this be the one you're looking at yes. instead of... Yeah. And God says, no. No. Isaac. There we go. Isaac is the one who continually stands before me. He does not miss the mark. And I love it. And we'll, we're going to straight into Hebrews here. But this is our great high priest. Yeah. Who was tempted in every way, yet never missed the mark. Mm-hmm. I mean, Jesus was, his goal on the earth wasn't uh, to do this, to do that, to do this, to do that. All right. Though it may seem that way because of the outward actions and things that happened. People were healed, they got cast out, and blind eyes were opened, and all this other stuff. But if you read the Psalms, they're the Psalms of the Christ. Mm-hmm. That that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's the Father and the Son. That I may behold Thy beauty. Yeah. That that I love. I love the way. I love the way. Um, the way it was written of of David, a man after my own heart. That's Jesus. That's the Lord. And He continues the same as you said it today, yesterday, today, forever. He continues the same. His one desire is to behold the beauty of his father. That's it. That's it. He never misses the mark. Never. And that's the great high priest that continually intercedes for us to bring us unto what he does. To that which he does. So. I was going to look look for something. I was hoping you'd oh. keep talking. Oh, well. <laughs> well, I mean, there's... What is the one, I shall be satisfied? The, the psalm about the resurrection and he should I shall be satisfied when I stand in your likeness or, or awaken in thy likeness that's the same thing that's the same thing there's satisfaction in that but anyway uh, Hebrews 4 now these the verses I mean you, you've been looking at too so you may have other things you want to other verses you want to go to but uh So there remains a rest for the people of God. This is verse 9. For the one who has entered his rest. See? The one who has entered his rest. Has himself also rested from his works. As God did from his. See? It starts right there. He's already found his rest. He's entered his rest. I like, sorry, just the the wording of it. And I, I, you can probably. Now this is New American Standard. But it's the same it's almost the same. I, I read the King James version, and, and like in Ephesians, the way the way it's worded, it says, "He is the head of the church." The fullness goes on like that, but then it almost seems like the church is that. No, no, hmm. no, no. He's the head of the church. Period. He is the fullness. He is the. He is. He is. Right. He is. Right. And even right there, he who has. Which, whomsoever, whichever soul who has entered his rest. Not like, you know, if I have entered into rest, like this soul has entered into its rest. Right. Has entered into his, very specific. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's where it, that's where it's real. That's where it's secured. That's where it's sure is the fact that he has entered his rest. I mean, that's, that's where it begins. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one, I mean, King James says, labor to enter into that rest, that, so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. Now, I was looking up a couple of these words. The vines actually, when they're talking about this verse, they say like this, let us labor to keep a continuous Sabbath rest. Oh. Now, 
I love that because it 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 says keep something that's already a continuous thing, not labor to enter into something you're not in yet. Yeah, it's to keep something. It's like I think uh, what is it uh, Ephesians four keeping the unity of the spirit because that unity's there because Christ is there. It's keeping it, not making it happen, not bringing it about, but keeping a continuous Sabbath rest. But then the word, actually, uh, the law and Nida talks about enter. And that's where we get, you know, labor to enter. Like it's something we're yet to get into. I know some people who still assume that they're not in Christ yet because they haven't reached that point. Uh, but if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. I mean... If you're in, born again, you are in him. But the word enter, according to Lowen Knight, and their, the way they do their uh, sections is 90.70. And it's, um, it doesn't mean to just come into. It can mean, and, and they gave this for this uh, verse, to begin to experience a state of being. To come into the experience of. So when it talks about entering, it's talking about entering into the experience of a rest that remains in Christ. That is there. That is established of God. I want to mention this. Sometimes this morning when I was thinking about that. It's, I mean, it, you're so prone to settle for a teaching or a message yeah. and not the experience of the reality. Mm-hmm. Because it's easier yeah. to, well, we think we've learned something, but we haven't at all, to grasp a teaching or a message. But you can't grasp an experience mm-hmm. because that requires God. That's right. You have and to that, submit to that word. And that can only happen when the Lord has spoken and has taught. Because then you come with, 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 without doubt you come exclusively to the person of Christ and then you experience something. Yeah. It's the same thing John on the Isle of Patmos. I heard the voice. I turned to see the voice when I saw him. Yeah. Immediately he experiences something. I felt his feet is dead. He didn't have to create an experience. Right. That's there in the scene of him. But in the scene of him... Well, it's like knowing as we are known. There is an are known. You know, there is a knowing of God that is established and sure that we are brought to know in the knowing of his son. The knowing of God. I feel heaven and earth. (laughs) What do you feel? (laughs) Exactly. That's right. But uh, then uh, the theological dictionary in the New Testament talks about this as well. Keep uh, to... Uh, enter into rest it says to act or to act in a way not to live as those who have been shut out or who have come short of the rest God has provided that means don't live under the seeming the assumption of having come short of this rest it's not it's not about coming in get get finally getting there it's about allowing God to unveil your soul to where you are. Abraham. Yeah. Lift up now thine eyes. From where you, from where you are. Exactly. You're seeing the place God has uh, brought you. You're seeing the reality God has provided in the person of the indwelling Christ. But th- these other verses, and Jimmy will come back and uh, talk about them. So... Uh, Again, this is New American Standard. Therefore, let us be diligent. That word labor there is actually diligence toward the pursuit of something. It's like diligently pursuing him, knowing him, uh, uh, setting the affection of your heart on that which is above. It's not about labor and toil. It's not about works. It is about a heart that is in full pursuit of this rest, that is in full pursuit of of Christ himself and will settle for nothing else. I remember uh, in the teachings I've done here recently 
where it says, you know, when they were on the road to Emmaus, and it says that Jesus made as if he would go on. He, 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 and one translation says he pretended as if he would go further. And it said they constrained him. They constrained him to come. And someone at the conference asked me, how do you explain the word constrain? Because some versions do a poor job of talking uh, or, or translating the word constrain. But I think it's a very forceful word. I think it is a desperation, a word of desperation. It's an act of desperation because these men had just heard Jesus expound the scriptures concerning himself. They heard the reality of the scripture declared by Christ outwardly, him talking to them of the scripture concerning himself. And then as he makes as if he's going to go on, they seize the opportunity because their heart, they say later, is burning within them. There is a desperation that is that has been ignited in their soul to know him in a greater way than the words. The words cause the burning in the heart. And the sad thing is most people will uh, settle for the burning in the heart. They'll settle for that feeling, that emotional response, or just the, the euphoric sense that maybe wonderful, uh, clear, eloquent teaching or, or maybe an experience or something in a service may bring you. But he's, he, he's affording them an opportunity to constrain him to something. And so when they asked me about constrain, I said, I think it's a, a word of desperation. It's like Jacob wrestling with the angel. I will not let you go until you, bl- I won't let you go until you bless me. I won't let you out of my sight until you come into this place and you un- unveil yourself as the meaning of the words you just said. And show me, and and we know that was in the opening of the eyes, but that's the diligence, I think, this year. We have to be diligent in our pursuit of this rest, in our pursuit of knowing Christ. Thanks, sir. Therefore, let us, go ahead. That diligence is birthed in our heart when Christ is declared. Absolutely. When the gospel is declared. Absolutely. Because that's what it does. It births in the heart an expectation to see that. Word. It's the expectation of the gospel, yeah. You can, you can even hear with, with, with the young John Baptist, there's one coming after me. Yeah, that's right. And when John sees him, behold, the one. And that's what Paul talks about when he says, be not moved away from the expectation of the gospel. Because, I'm going to tell you, preachers, Christians, whoever, they will move you away. They will divert your attention from the hope that the gospel brings. And if it doesn't bring you to this desperate need to see him, it's not the gospel. If it doesn't leave you with that hope, and that is your only hope, then it's not the gospel. I uh, I was, gosh, I think it was probably this year, or maybe then the last year. I, I, I began, you know, I mean, when I say the gospel, I've been trying to be really specific sometimes when I say the gospel of God. Yeah. Because the gospel of God produces the expectation of God mm-hmm. in the heart of man. Yeah, what is it? Thessalonians, the gospel of God concerning his son. Yeah. Any other gospel, I would say, though there is no other gospel, mm-hmm. will produce a false expectation yeah. every time. It may be a good expectation, but it will nonetheless be a false expectation because it will not bring or it does not have the correct object in view. And object, I don't mean it like, like this little thing right here. It does not have Christ the person himself in view. Yeah. It has something less in view. To. Let me read these uh, last verses here. And like I said, you, you've been looking at this probably longer than I have. So. Uh, but what I've been, uh, today when I was looking at this, it just stood out because uh, Kim, my wife, has been pointing a verse out to me that I want to uh, talk about 
here because this rest and this diligence to seek that rest or to keep that rest, to know and experience that rest, it brings you to this. And I love this because this is, this is, this is a part of the rest. This is a part of what it costs the liberty that comes. The Sabbath. Where all things are perfect. The word of God. Because look, let us be diligent to enter that rest. So no one will fail according to the same example of disobedience. He talked about that earlier. For the word of God is living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's just not talking about words. It's talking about the word of God. The word himself. The word that was in the beginning with God. That word. I believe is talking about that word. The word of God is living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. It brings a division between what is soul and what is spirit. What is me and what is Christ. Both of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is this is the this is the part uh, my wife and I have been talking about uh, about manifest and, and all that because this has to do with this rest. It's all the same thought, but see to know this rest, experience this rest, we have to allow this this division to be taking place in the heart, where I'm not looking at me. To define whether I've entered that rest or not. And I'm not looking at how I am or what I'm doing or how I'm doing. To, to realize, to, to, here it is, to measure or define whether God has found his rest or not. Because that's what it really is. Because the rest that I find or comprehend or know and experience is, is merely God's rest being revealed in me. It's God's rest being worked in my soul. So when I am disillusioned and, and dissatisfied and, and my soul is in that type of turmoil, which causes me to try to labor and work and try to make it up, I'm saying, well, God hasn't found his rest yet. I'm living in that type of understanding. Okay, sir. Um, verse 13. So here's the judgment between the spirit and soul. There is no creature hidden from his sight. This is God's view, God's sight, but all things are open, laid bare. It's like it's a they uh, it's like everything is openly manifest before his sight. Everything is made manifest before him. He sees all things clearly. He sees all things perfectly. He knows what is his son, he knows what is not. He sees all things open. There is nothing hidden from him. Or we could say he knows him who remains and that which is put away. Yeah, exactly. His view is constrained to his son. That is openly manifest to him. The rest is, the rest to me comes here. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, let us hold fast our confession, it goes into the high priest and all. But to me, the, the rest is this. His view. His seeing. Where everything is laid bare, opened, and made manifest before him. He sees it clearly because he sees everything in the light of his son. Because his son determines everything. You know, what is and what isn't. What's real, what's not. He sees that. He's not made the fool of. It's just like Ishmael and Isaac. God is not mocked in that. He has the one in view. And that is what this is saying. God's view, it's manif everything is manifest before him openly. The rest comes into our soul when this seeing, where all things are open, made manifest, clearly seen. And it's clearly seen in, his, in the Son, in, in, in the face of His Son, when that view is revealed in me. And that view is going to do this, cut asunder, divide, bring division. But that's not because that division hasn't already happened. Yeah. 
That's because my carnal mind is incapable of knowing that division. That's a work God has to do in my soul to make my soul able to experience the rest that I've already been brought to. To comprehend what I've already been brought into. Um, you may have mentioned this in one of your previous classes. Some reasons, uh, I can think of it. You probably have to say, yeah, no, 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 after I say it. But uh, even right here, it's dealing with the high priest. When the high priest went in, he was out of the sight of all Absolute. Israel. All, he was bailed. All the people, the body of God. And he completed a work. And guess what? He lives. You know, when if, if he would if he would have not been accepted of God, he they would have drug him out on a rope. Yeah. Probably. He, he never would have walked out mm -hmm. standing as the living one. Now um, he himself, we I mentioned it earlier, Christ himself is the finished work of God. Mm -hmm. He is that. He's the one who is accepted. You know, his acceptance before the Father. Back, back to the example with with uh, Israel in the tabernacle and the high priest. There's an acceptance there. Even if Israel has not yet seen that acceptance, it's already done. He is accepted. Absolutely. Already. And I he did is, teach that. He's, he's there. He's yeah. accepted. Yeah. And what yet is remaining for Israel to see him who lives? Because it's not. That's that Colossians it's, 3. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. It's not that, yes. It's not that they're going to see, oh, God accepts me. No, God accepts him. And I, salvation is found in him. Yeah. He is my salvation, he is my acceptance. I, and even with the example with Israel in the tabernacle and the high priest. I didn't have to do a thing. Praise God. And guess what happens when they see him? When he finally appears. He becomes the unveiled view of God unto them. He becomes God's view in their midst. He becomes an unveiled view of their salvation. But what happens is, it is now in earth as it is in heaven. Exactly. Because heaven is the holy of holies, is the type of it. It is now in the seeing of him in earth as it already is in heaven. Specifically, the kingdom of God is governing the earth. Absolutely. That's, that's so significant in that. And all Israel at that moment, when they see their high priest, are at rest. Yeah. Brother Artis is getting antsy. Uh, <laughs> no connection. Oh, we lost our connection. Um, so, it's, we'll end it here, but it's so significant that he brings the rest finally into this high priest because of what you just said. Because that's exactly what it's all about. It's the one standing before the face of God. It's the one who stands there accepted. That's the rest. That's the rest that was always there in the type. That was the rest that was always there in the testimony. That was a testimony of it. Their rest was there's one who stands before God accepted. And we are found in him. We are accepted in him. And when he appears to them, that he has on what he call, what, what's called the breastplate of judgment. As the judgment of that, he appears in their midst. What does that do? Divides. And now, divides. And now they are governed by that judgment. By the view of God. Mm -hmm. By the view of the Father. The one who is openly shown, made manifest unto him. Uh, it may be hidden from their sight, but it's not hidden from his. It's made manifest. Um, and here's the, when you go into chapter 6 of that, it talks about the one who stands in the holy, the hope we have as an anchor of the soul. That expectation, the anchor of the soul that is sure and steadfast, the one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered for us, having become the high priest forever. It's the order of Melchizedek. And that's the rest. And that's our anchor. But only, it's only really the anchor of those who are seeing and whose expectation is set yeah. upon the continual seeing 
of that one. Otherwise, we're going to live right here, seeming to have come short. Why? Because just like in the testimony, it's still veiled. He's accepted. He's before the Father, but it's veiled from us. We can't see. It's veiled. It's veiled. Wall who would perceive themselves as outsiders. Yes. Absolutely. That's it. All right. Well, I think we're out of time. Brother Arliss is telling us we're out of time. He's done everything but he's done everything but set the booth on fire. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna call it Amen tonight. Uh thanks for being with us. Uh, again, feel free to send us questions or uh, comments about the classes or anything you'd like, any kind of communication. We'd appreciate it, and we will respond to, uh, to it. So uh, with that being said, we'll, we'll end it tonight, and uh, Wednesday night is our next uh, live session. So amen. That's it.